الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبته ومن اهتدى بهديه إلى يوم اللقاء وبعد So in the sixth year after Hijrah So the Islamic calendar because I have young ones here so I, I will explain The Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his migration from Mecca to Medina all other calendars start by someone's birthday or someone's death day and so on and so forth. So if you look at the you know, Christian calendar, it started at the birth of Christ. Um, and other calendars started at the start of a reign of a king or the death or the birth and so on. The Islamic calendar starts at the migration of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina. So... When we say six years after Hijrah, as in six years after the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina. So Islam before that started in Mecca. And it was in Mecca for 13 years. So for 13 years, the Prophet preached to the people of Mecca. And eventually left Mecca after 13 years in camp to Medina, so initial 13 years, then another six years of da'wah. So now we are on the sixth year after Hijrah. You all with me? So sixth year after Hijrah, the Prophet wasallam decided to expand the da'wah beyond his own borders, beyond his vicinity. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent eight letters to eight different kings. Kings from the Arab and the Ajam. So it went far and wide. This is the sixth year after Hijrah. And one of the kings he sent it to is Thumama ibn Uthal. Thumama is the Sayyid of Banu Hanifa. He is the leader of the tribe of Banu Hanifa in the areas of Najd. And um, he reigned over a place called Yamama. And he was a man authoritative enough. People had gathered around him enough, were obedient to him enough to warrant a letter from the Prophet ﷺ. Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't send the letter, he only sent eight letters. And Thumama was one that qualified to receive a letter as a monarch, as a leader, as a king from the Prophet ﷺ. And when the letter came, his ego and his, you know, prior programming, took the better of him and he rejected the invite of the Prophet ﷺ. Remember the name Thumama ibn Uthal. So, and not only that, he killed the messenger of the Prophet ﷺ. And the fire of hatred burnt so much inside him because how do I explain this, you know? Because we live in 2020 in Australia, very different from the desert in the time of the Prophet. You know, cultures differ from place to place and the cultures of the Arabs of those days, the respect and reverence of their forefathers was very huge. So if you told them, come to this deen, and the deen says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, there is nothing worthy of worship except for one Allah, which means all the other gods are false, that really annoyed him, because what about my father? You know, what did they worship? So, Thumama, burning with anger, 
even decided he is going to kill the Prophet But his uncle intervened, you know that this is not a normal man you're going to go and, and, and uh, attack. Like this is a, a man whose people uh, hold on to every utterance of. So he refrained from killing the Prophet, like trying to attack the Prophet but nonetheless, he attacked some of the Sahaba and, uh, you know, took, uh, and some of the Sahaba were hurt and died at his hand. So the Prophet wasallam reached a place where he declared him uh, an enemy of Islam and the Muslims and his blood viable. So this is Thumama. And then Subhanallahi biyadihi al maqadir. So lesson number one. Notice that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the sixth year has a relative degree of comfort in his surroundings. The locals have become Muslims. Uh, he is the Prophet of Allah. He is revered. He is obeyed. There's peace, tranquility and so on and so forth. Yet... The Prophet وسلم, sends letters out to other people and in particular to their monarchs and their kings. This teaches us a couple of lessons, dear ones. Lesson number one. Allah Rabbul Izzah has given me and you and the Sahaba and the Prophet before us this light of guidance. This light is not a light designed for you to hide under your arm. Nor a light for you to use with your home and family and then don't care about what happens to the rest of humanity. So from a place of care, from a place of concern, from a place of love, from a place of humanity, the Prophet wasallam, as soon as he has the opportunity, extends the da'wah to the next realm. So you yourselves, Allah protect and bless you, Ya Rab. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed your house with guidance. You're Muslims, you pray, you come here to the masjid, walillahi alhamdu wal minna. Uh, Allah has shown you right from wrong. You know, you have guidance. And wallah, sometimes you don't know what guidance is. Like you don't know the fadl of Allah Rabbul Izzah upon you for guidance. Can I give one rude, simple example? Because I've got young ones sitting in front of me. Like at the very least, the Quran taught you personal hygiene. Like the deen taught you personal hygiene. You know, when you go to the bathroom, wash. Like that is something 80% of the population are struggling with. Because they use a toilet paper, walk out and think it's done. And if you put mud on this cloth here and toilet paper it, you'll see a stain mark here. That's not done, sweetheart. You gotta wash it. Do you understand me? Like there's guide. Uh, that's that's as simple as I can make it. Like even that in 2020, people are still struggling with basic hygiene and forget about finding their Lord. Why off? So when I say Allah has given you guidance introspect and think from the smallest to the biggest Allah and His Prophet taught you how. I was uh, in a meeting yesterday and I saw a couple and I said, you didn't know that alcohol is good or bad. You drank, you saw the product, you know, whether that's a drink driving and a car accident, whether that's the morning after pill, whether that's like, oh my God, what did I do last night? All that happened because you drank. You drank because you didn't know that drinking was bad. Someone didn't tell you that, listen, Allah has forbidden this. That's guidance. Do you understand me? One of the people I worked with in my last work, you know, many, many years ago, he told me, he said, uh, my, brother, my brother was killed. So I am thinking, you know, alhamdulillah, this is Australia. Allah protected, Ya Rab. 
you know, there's a place of peace. We are not at war. There's no famine. What do you mean they killed my brother? He said, my brother went out partying with his friends, you know, miners from the uh, mining field. And, what, and in mining, you wear steel cap boots. You know what I'm talking about? Steel cap boots. Steel cap boots. So because they got drunk, an argument happened, they got carried away, they kicked my brother in the head and he died. Trace it back, they drank. They, you know, their senses became, their sensitized, their awareness died, they made silly decisions. Because no one told them that, listen, forbidden, wrong, bad for you. So... At every stage I can talk, but my point is, Allah has given you guidance, clarity, instructions of what to do at every step. And people outside are yearning, dying, confused, looking for it. So it becomes your duty to share this light. Let others see, dear ones. And before they can see with their eyes, their hearts must accept. So you must become people whose character enters the heart, who, whose character opens the doors of the hearts. You, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? So that then they see the haq and guidance through you. That's the first one. Become proactive in sharing the light. Because وَرَبُّ الْكَعْبَ Allah has given you light. And if a person becomes guided at your hands, it is better for you than the world and what is in it. It is better for you than the world and what is in it. And Allah honor me and you with becoming a source of guidance for those that are not guided. First one. Second lesson, note that the Prophet wasallam sent the invites out to the leaders of the tribes. Because the social structure of humankind is such that a leader has clout. A leader has influence. If a leader chooses a certain direction, it is likely that more people will follow that direction. So for example, if you teach a Amazing lesson, a new concept, give a new idea to the head of an institution. Imagine you give an idea to the head of a school. He has and she has the capacity to roll that out amidst a hundred students and 20 teachers. And if the institution's bigger, bigger students, and do you understand me? And if it's a university, and if it's a king, who is beloved by his people, he becomes guided. You know, if you look at how they market things, you know, a lot of you are wearing clothing. If you trace it back, you're wearing it because you saw someone wear it on TV somewhere. I mean, not now because now you're in the mosque, but you know, when, when you dress to be cool outside, uh, you dress because you saw someone else. You saw Beckham or you saw... Uh, some movie star and uh, when, when you wear it, you, you think you're that, you know. So the leader has clout. So imagine if that person, instead of flaunting a shirt or a t-shirt, is now uh, promoting Islam. And I saw a beautiful example in the Pakistani cricket team. You know, and uh, one of the brothers, and alhamdulillah, they've always been Muslims, but um, he turned more to Islam and you saw the beard grow and the prayer. And then you saw it in other clubs and in other countries and others. And people started to show their colors um, in the sports arena, to show their Islam. And now Allah bless and protect and Ya Rab, uh, honor him in both the worlds. Khabib can. So now... You know, you see a lot of other UFC fighters, you know, proud of the colors of Islam, confident in their heritage, want to talk about it. And because, you know, leadership, whether that's authority by position or iconic because you're big and, and uh, it, from wisdom, if you want to be more effective, invest in something that has 
more returns. So the Prophet وسلم, went to these like sent messages because now he's, he's busy. He can't go individual city to city and door to door. So he sent messages out and Sumama was one of those. So Sumama rejected whose message? Huh? The Prophet of Allah, which shows you what? That in your da'wah, at times your message is going to get rejected because you are not better at it than the Prophet of God. And that's all right. Cop it on the chin and keep going. It's just part of life. And it's to uh, develop you and strengthen you. And uh, you get, uh, you know, if you earn something through difficulty, yeah, there's more reward in it than to get it easily. So, walillahi alhamd. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba here um, were challenged by Sumama and some of them died in the process. So Subhanalladhi biyadihi al-maqadir, Sumama decided he is going to go to Umrah. And again, because I have different types of people sitting here, may Allah protect you all. Umrah is when you go to Mecca and circumambulate around the... Kaaba. And there's some other things, but for this, this is not an Umrah lesson. So he decided he is going to go to Umrah. They used to do Umrah before Islam as well in their own style. He's going to do Umrah, sacrifice to the idols, and then come back. Around this time, the scouts or the army or a battalion of Islam is going through a similar area. The two cross and they capture him. They capture who? Thumama. But they don't know this is Thumama. So they bring him to Medina. And they tie him in one of the pillars of the masjid. Waiting for the Prophet to give instruction that who is this? First of all, who is your Prophet? Because the Prophet knows. And secondly, what should we do with him? So the Prophet sees him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from afar and he says, do you know who you've brought? So they go, no Allah and his Prophet knows best. So he said, this is Thumama. You know, the one that killed the messenger of the messenger and the one that had hurt and killed some of the ashab. So, and now he is a captive in the heart of Islam, like in the mosque of the Prophet. The door of the house of the Prophet opens into the mosque and other doors open inside and inside. This is the city center of Islam, you know, so it's tied there. So first question to you, dear ones, put yourselves in this position where a person has rejected your invite killed your messenger, planned to kill you, and then killed some of your companions as well. And now you have him at your mercy. Do you understand? And this is the heart of Islam and the heart of a prophet. Learn. So the prophet said, this is Tumama ibn Uthal. So, tend to him well, like look after him, make sure he's comfortable. And then he وسلم, went into his own house and he said, prepare some food for Sumama and ordered that in the morning and in the afternoon, the camel should be milked and camel milk should be taken to him. To who? Who did what? Rejected his message, killed his messenger, killed his Sahaba. So the Prophet وسلم, let him be like this and met him a day later. You see, human management, human psychology is an art. 
a lot of times we do something in a way that is not productive when we expect productive results. We don't know the psychology of the person we're dealing with. We do something that totally annoys the person and we expect a response of total satisfaction. You understand? If the Prophet ﷺ had gone to Thumama straight away like this, ah, what happened, huh? Remember what you did to you remember what you did to my message? Uh, he could have. So Mama would have responded in the same arrogance that you would expect a Bedouin leader to respond. Or he would be scared. There would be no chance of heart change. It would be either fear or anger. So the Prophet wasallam opened the doors of his heart before he opened the doors of his eyes and ears. Like he conditioned the man to relax, put down his guards, uh, disperse of his fears and anxieties and hatred. Because when he eats your food at your mercy, when he gets a drink at your mercy and he's expecting uh, retribution, naturally he's going to be indebted to you like oh, I said all these bad things about this guy, did all these silly things and here he is milking camels for me to feed me and he doesn't have to, you know, I'm, I'm a slave, I'm a servant or captive at his, at his mercy. So, and the Prophet waited. And wait, dear ones, a lot of times we do something and we want it now. And now is not the right time for it. Tomorrow or the day after is. Like this issue of rushing, wanting everything yesterday causes a lot of problems. So notice the Prophet obviously wants to finalize this matter. He obviously wants to conclude and, you know, get a closure on this, on, on this issue, but he holds back, just feed him, look after him, uh, be hospitable, waits a day, doesn't face to face him in case he says something that is disrespectful. And then the prophet, do you understand me? What, creates the climate and ambience acceptable for a successful discussion. And then next day he comes to him and he says, Mada indak ya thumama? How are things with you, Thumama? And the adab of the Rasul, because the word has every type of meaning in it. Mada indak, like how are things, Thumama? You know, if you have the brain of a goldfish, you will look around, you say, game up, I'm at your mercy. Uh, you know, instead of saying, what do you want me to do with you? Do you want me to cut you? Do you want me to bash you? Do you want me to make it a little piece and send it to mommy? You know, stuff like that. No, it just says, Mada indak ya Thumama? How are things? So Thumama says, and imagine, he's a person in a tribal system. Normal systems are easy because votes, you know. Tribal system, he's become a king. Like this, this personality you're dealing with. So, he says, عندي الخير, all good. And then, he says, إن تنعم تنعم على شاكر. Listen, O Muhammad. If you be benevolent, you will be benevolent on someone who knows how to be grateful. Like if you decide to be magnanimous, gracious, I know how to be grateful. And in tuqtil, tuqtil dha damin. And if you kill, if you decide to kill me, then know that you kill someone who was a person of dha damin, as in a person with lineage and with tribe and with community. Like they will come ask for the compensation of that blood, whether that's by blood or by money. Like killing me is not an easy affair. I have a tribe there. And if you want money, if you want, you know, ransom, ask, it will be granted. 
So the Prophet went sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi abi huwa wa ummi. Went, prayed, and the hadith of Abu Hurairah, he didn't come to him the next day. Then he came the day after. So he's waiting for Sumama to acclimatize, to see the Sahaba, see the characters, see the community, let the kindness marinate, let it go into the, into the mind, let it soak, let the conditioning happen, let the man get prepared and you see the hikmah and knowing psychology and knowing the hearts and minds of men and having this is something we are so alien to these days. Because we look at a little verse or a hadith here and we follow it as, as we think by our own understandings and there's an ocean we are unaware of. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam missed a day, came a day after and asked him the same question again. Mada indak ya Thumama? How are things with you, O Thumama? So Thumama says, like I told you yesterday, in taqtul taqtul dha damin, if you kill, you kill someone whose blood is weighty, who has tribe and lineage, they will come seeking, you know, revenge or compensation. Wa in tun'im tun'im ala shakir. And if you are graceful and gracious and benevolent and magnanimous, then I know how to be grateful. And if you want wealth, ask, it will be granted. So the Prophet left him and went. Now, imagine you, Sumama, what are you thinking? Because you're not, you're not there for a minute. You're sitting there days thinking. You have nothing to do but to think. Because no one's making you farm. You're just sitting. So sitting, what else are you going to do? You're looking and thinking. So then the Prophet ﷺ came for a third time. After this day, the next day. So the first, he met him first after, you know, the first meeting. Then missed the day. Then now met him the next day without missing. And this is the beauty of mine and your religion. That the record is so particularly accurate. You know, they haven't missed the beat. Like we know who told us the story. We know which year it happened. We know which pillar of the mosque he was tied to. We know which day the prophet spoke to him. We know which day he missed. We know what food he was presented. This is the beauty of this deen. Because it is from there to us, heart to heart and book to book. So third meeting, the Prophet ﷺ came, asked him, Mada indak ya Thumama? How are things with... And can you ask yourself, what's the Prophet doing? Like when I... I mean, I am in education, alhamdulillah, uh, a lot of my students sit here, you know, past and present. Um, when you talk to an individual... In the conversation, in the body language, in the eyes, the secrets that words cannot convey. So the Prophet from his demeanor can tell what's happened inside the head and heart of this man. You know, an angry person full of hatred looks different to a person looking at you in awe and splendor. So third day the Prophet ﷺ asked him, he repeated, he goes, as I told you, all good, but if you kill me, Understand my blood is weighty. If you're benevolent and gracious, I know how to be grateful. And if you want wealth, ask it will be granted. So the Prophet ﷺ said, release Thumama. I don't want to make you indebted to me, nor do I want to kill you, nor do I want compensation. Go. I don't know if you can become Thumama for a second. Like, this is a man you've hated. This is a man you fought inside your head. Oh, if I get my hands on you. You know how you talk in your head when you're angry at someone and you're, it's talking to you. Um, this is the man who you've attacked his companions. This is the man you plan to kill. All that. And now this man comes, feeds you, hosts you, 
even orders milk to be brought to you twice a day and then releases you. Like it must be perplexing at, at least, you know, and to the level where you want to shout. So Sumama left the masjid, walked out. Went to near the Baqi. There's an orchard there and there was a well. So he took water, washed himself, cleaned himself very well. And because the sun is hot, so you dry up pretty quick or not. So he came a few minutes later back into the masjid, now washed and cleaned. So Muslims are there, alhamdulillah. So he says, Ya Muhammad, your face was the most hated face to me. Allah has made it the most beloved face to me. Your land was the most hated land to me. Allah has made it the most beloved land to me. Your religion was the most hated religion to me. Allah has made it the most beloved religion to me. I swear, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka la rasulullah. I swear that there is none worthy of worship save Allah and you're the Prophet of God. It is easy to be kind to kindness. You know, if I give you a hundred bucks, hundred dollars, the natural thing to say is thank you. Ustaz Jazakallah, you are you sure? Uh, and maybe you'll walk with me outside the door, you know. And if you don't, I'll say, Khalas miskin, something is wrong with him, you know. He's, uh, but normal behavior. And if your uncle sees you and I give you a gift and you don't say thank you, he'll go home and tell you, says, Habibi, what happened? Like no one has taught you enough manners to say, Jazakallah, Ustaz, thank you, you know. Because normal requirement in every culture is kindness. You will that's, that's normal. A bit better than that is to be kind in a neutral ground. Like, you know, I haven't done anything good for you. You don't know me. You see me in the street carrying a bag. You say, Ustaz, let me help you with that. So I say, you are kind to me without having, oh, you know. The challenge is to be kind in the face of unkindness. You know, because every element, every chemical, every cell from the tip of your toe to the top of your head is burning with rage and anger, with revenge and hatred. You want retribution. Um, that's normal. But now, what type of heart must you have that not only have you forgiven, but are being kind and nice as well? And especially, and kind and nice is okay when you're weak, because what else are you going to do? He is tied up in your mosque. Like, he's at your mercy. Mercy here, given his history of what he's done, this is why he is rahmatul lil alameen. Do you see? Mercy to your enemies. And such level of mercy that the mercy kills the, the hatred that is in their heart and turns it to love for you. So Thumama became a Sahabi, became a Muslim, a follower of the Prophet. And he says, from now on, myself, my person, my sword and my men are at your disposal. Like I am... I am yours to command. And then he remembers the wrong he did because he's killed people from the Muslims. So he said, oh, Prophet, I, I have killed your men. What do I need to do about that? So the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تثريب عليك اليوم. There's no blame on you today. Islam forgives whatever can be for it. And the beauty of Islam, that it gives the opportunity for a fresh start. You know, it gives it upon Islam, and it gives it upon Hijrah, from a, you know, and it gives it upon Hajj. Fresh start. So, so Sumama said, Oh Prophet, I was intending to go to Umrah. 
What should I do about that? So the Prophet said, go to Umrah, but go to Umrah on the tradition of prophethood, on the method of Islam and not on the method of your tribe. So then the Prophet wasallam taught him how to perform the Umrah as a Muslim. And he is the first one that has sung the Talbiyah in the Haram from the Muslims. This is Thumama. And the Quraysh used to say it's similar, but they had words of shirk in theirs. So Thumama arrived in Mecca uh, to perform Umrah. And he sings out at the top of his voice, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ وَالنِّعْمَةَ لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ when the Quraysh heard this, like they know that this is not the, the normal one. So they, they burnt with anger because the Islam that they're fighting and keeping in Medina, now it is singing inside the haram in their backyard, you know, Bibatni Mecca. So the young worked up and some took their swords and the elderly saw, they go, hey, this is Thumama, this is not... You know, your normal person that has come here, there's a whole tribe of Banu Hanifa that will come here if you do anything to him. So they shield the swords and went to him and said, Yes, yeah, Thumama, what is, what is happening? Have, have you become confused? He says, No, a Muslim, I've become a Muslim. So they say they bashed him a little bit, you know, because enough, they, enough self control to keep the swords shielded. Khalas, that's as much as you can expect. They're still going to ruffle a bit. So he said, men of Quraysh, I swear to you, upon my return, not a grain will come to you from that side. Like, and he blocked a whole, a whole side, you know, this is uh, sanctions from Sumama, you know, nothing's coming. And again, the sanctions, sanctions started to bite, you know, Produce reduced, wealth reduced, and usually the, the, the weakest suffer the most in sanctions. So the kids and the women and the poor. And the cries eventually reached the Prophet, I am being metaphorical, meaning the complaints, the letters. They sent a letter to the Prophet وسلم, who? The Quraysh, his enemies, to say, Ya Muhammad, Although we are of different faiths, we are still family. Now order this friend of yours to remove the sanction because, you know, we, our kids are dying out of hunger. And again, the Quraysh people, you know the story of Bilal. You know the story of Ammar. You know the story of Sumayya. Quraysh did it. And the reason the Prophet migrated because they came behind his house to assassinate him, the Quraysh did it, the same people of Mecca. Then they came to attack him in Badr, and then they came to attack him in Uhud, and then they came to attack him in Ahzab. The Quraysh did it. Now they are begging for mercy from him that, listen, our kids are dying out of hunger. So the Prophet sallallahu and Subhanallah, to give you context, in our time, sanctions were placed on Iraq. Two million people died and no relief from the sanctions. Yet for the Prophet ﷺ, a letter came that our kids are hungry and crying. The Prophet ﷺ ordered Thumama, Thumama, I haven't been sent to, you know, deprive kids of food. I am Rahmatul lil Alameen, remove your embargo and sanctions. Do you see? Rahmatul lil Alameen. And so, dear ones, my topic that was on the poster at least is وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The verse says, listen to the verse, and alhamdulillah, I look around, there's Ahlul Ilm and Ahlul Fadl around here. The verse says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah Rabbul Izza didn't say, وَأَرْسَلْنَاكَ رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ He didn't say, and we sent you as a mercy to the world. Allah Rabbul Izza said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Oh Prophet, 
we have sent you as nothing else but a mercy to the world. Like first, Allah negates all else. Like there's no other component in your mission. Illa rahmatan lil alameen. But you're a mercy to the world. And Allah sent them not a mercy lil nas. Not a mercy just to me and you. He is a mercy to the world. He is a mercy to the world. And again, as I said at the beginning, you see mercy, you, you want to see merciful. Look at, look at the person in times where he should be retaliating and then see what his response is.